Blog Talk Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to Hypergalactic Enigmas, I'm your host, Dr. Franklin Rule, along with co-host Benny Guzman, and our special guest tonight, Ms. Cassio Terrell Aurelian. And I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Are you there? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? I hear you. Yes, did I pronounce your name yes. correctly? Cassio, did oh? I pronounce your name correctly? Oh, Cassio Perrier. I'm Perrier. Okay, yeah, well, welcome to the welcome. show. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to start off tonight with something in the news regarding what's been dubbed the Goldilocks planet. It's a new planet that's been discovered around the star Gelisi 581. For those of you taking notes, that's G-L-I-E-S-I-E-S-E. And even conservative scientists now are agreeing that this planet is Earth-like and could support life because water could flourish upon it. And one scientist, Dr. Stephen Voth, is 100% sure it does contain life, and he argues that we should be finding um, 1 in 5 to 1 in 10 stars having an Earth-like planet. Well, what I would like to say is that we don't have the technology yet when looking at alien stars to detect small rocky planets that are Earth-like. We can detect gas giants, but the smaller ones remain undetectable. And it's my thesis that every single star, first of all, is encircled by a family of planets, some of which are gas giants, but others of which may be Earth-like rocky bodies. But I want to go on to further assert that even if a, a planet is not in this Goldilocks zone, where water would not boil. I assert that based on the counterexamples we have on Earth, where life seems to be able to exist in every single temperature zone, terrible, tremendous pressures under the sea, and the Sahara Desert where we have silver ants flourishing at 136 degrees Fahrenheit, where we have bacteria and sulfur pits and nuclear water, that every planet harbors some type of life. Of course, not Earth-like, not as we know it. But life, I believe, has evolved in every set of circumstances so that we should expect a, an entire spectrum of bioforms ranging from lower to higher entities on each and every planet, in, none of which are necessarily English-speaking, humanoid, or intelligent. But on some of those worlds, intelligence will evolve, and with that, a space technology in some cases, arguing for the validity of UFO sightings. And I just want to point out that in our own Milky Way galaxy, we have some 400 billion stars. So if we have 10 planets per star, that's 4 trillion planets in our galaxy, 400 billion trillion in our island universe, where we may have another 100 billion galaxies. These numbers are mind-boggling. And they argue for me that the universe is literally teeming with life. And this discovery just is one small piece of evidence that we're not alone in the universe. And I want to point out, as I've mentioned, I think, previously in this show, that some planetary moons may also harbor life because some have atmospheres, some have subsurface liquids, and therefore we could have another, let's say, five occupied moons per star or another two trillion possible life-bearing moons per star. So, again, I claim... 
that the universe is literally teeming with life, that life indeed is the common, yes, the common denominator of the cosmic backdrop. What do you have to say to that, Bernie, if any? Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. And um, I remember I was reading an article in Popular Science that said um, they, they could see uh, uh, another Earth, or they were calling it another Earth. Um, they didn't really give, I didn't hear that name. Um, but, yes, that there was, uh, you know, possibly another Earth that could even possibly harbor life. Um, even, um, I'm not really too much on the whole Planet X thing or the, the planet Nibiru, but um, some, some things I was reading online, they even mentioned it to be, um, you know, Earth-like. And some even say that uh, uh, it was um, at one time a part of Earth, uh, the, uh, the planet Nibiru. So, yeah, definitely... Um, uh, the, the universe is full of life, whether it's intelligent, uh, bacteria, or, um, you know, it, 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 there, you have life everywhere. You know, no matter if it has intelligence or not, it, it's still life. Right. And I keep pointing out, you know, we take for granted creatures like, say, the panda and the octopus and the porcupine uh, is acceptable. But they're really strange creatures. It's just that we're so familiar with them that we accept them as being part of the ecology of our planet. But equally bizarre creatures may populate each and every planet, no matter how hostile its atmosphere appears to be. That's my contention. That's why I keep saying exactly. we are not alone in the universe. That's right. We are not alone. It's just like in the Bible days when they would encounter these beings. They were used to seeing these creatures. You know, like nowadays, here in the 21st century, if if that kind of activity started happening here on planet Earth, it would be, you know, shocking. You know, people probably couldn't handle it. But, you know, at that time, they were so used to having, uh, you know, visitations from these, uh, these alien beings, you know. Well, of course, I think in the biblical era, people, we didn't have the news media, so only a few people would have seen some of these creatures, and we don't know how they would have reacted. Now, we go back uh, to night just... 1939 and Orson Welles' War of the World depiction on the radio, and that did trigger a certain degree of panic because people were not uh, really thinking about alien life as, as, and were, were frightened. But I think today, uh, even if a UFO landed, because we've had so much discussions uh, in so many movies and TV shows about aliens, plus all of the uh, tabloids and shows like ours, that if a UFO was to land in the White House lawn or anywhere else where it was widely covered, people would not panic. They'd be, you know, because they're expecting it. We've been conditioned to expect aliens to land on our planet from all the TV shows, movies, tabloid stories, etc. So it wouldn't, be, so wouldn't pose such a shock as it did, say, in the 1930s with Orson Welles' uh, rendition on the radio. Yeah, I believe if, if a landing happened and, and the help of uh, some... Uh of, of the media, you know, and some political support, I believe it would be pretty, probably pretty well accepted, um, which I think uh, this would be a, a good, you know, a good time for Cassio to jump in on us. Uh, okay. If, if you want, Cassio. Um, man, you talked about something similar to this the other day about um, landings. If you want, you could uh, share with us, uh, start with the Raelian movement. Um, yeah, sure. So um, we believe in... Um, in intelligent design, so we think that there's um, an advanced civilization that created all form of life on Earth, and we can find traces um, of their work in all ancient uh, books, like the Bible. For example, I know uh, last week you talked about the Elohim in the Bible, which actually is a plural and means uh, those who came from the sky, and who was uh, mistranslated by God. And I believe that actually Bible is a um, eight years book. And um, so, um, as a Raelian, um we um, think that uh, no, that's what I wanted to say. But uh, yeah, definitely um, they created of um, form of life on Earth, and uh, our. Um, goal is actually to um, spread this message and also to uh, build an embassy uh, to welcome them. Would that be in America uh, or in Canada, Cassio? Uh, well, we're not sure um, yet. We're waiting for, we, um, um, we're waiting from, uh, 
uh, authorization from different countries we asked for. Uh, so it might be in China, actually. Okay, China. Uh, where is Rayo headquartered yeah, well, today? Uh, today, well, Rayo I mean, who uh, received. Uh, well, well, who received this message from the Elohim uh, lives in uh, Japan half time and in um, in the U.S. The other half of the year. Uh, how many members are there of the Raelian Society, approximately? Uh, now there's like about sixty thousand members. Is that sixteen or sixty thousand? Sixty. Sixty thousand members. Oh, well, give us uh, some of the background on this. Because I don't think a number of our viewers may not be familiar with Ray Hale. Well, when was contacted, he was uh, he's. When uh, was that? He was contacted in 1973 in France, and that's uh, when the um, the rain movement started. And he got this revelation. Um, he got um, contacted by this uh, Elohim, and uh, he got the revelation that all life on Earth was created uh, thanks to science by this um, scientific civilization, and they, um, they sent all the prophets on earth, uh, like Moses, Buddha, Mohammed, and Jesus, to help humanity um, to get to this age that we are now, and to prepare humanity to welcome them. This is also our goal, because we believe they'll come back. So when you talk about, well, if, if they're coming back, if the UFOs, they land on the White House, well, I don't know. They will be welcomed by the army. I'm not sure. Like uh, there will be. Well, the military philosophy is shoot first, ask questions later. So I wouldn't trust them. Or we should capture them and put them on exhibit on uh, pay TV or some alien exobiological garden. So I can understand them uh, avoiding landing, uh, you know, on the White House lawn or some equally populated place. Uh, were the, uh, you say they created humans. Was this through genetic engineering of existing species? At what point did they start? For example, did they take the apes and experiment on them or a, an earlier form of life? No, they created thanks to the DNA from scratch. Like now, scientists, scientists they're creating like little bacteria from scratch. So they right. created everything from scratch. That's Oh, so they didn't take existing life forms and experiment, but uh, went to the basic no. uh, genome and, uh, and created no, life. No. no, they created, they had laboratories and they created everything. About and now we can understand it's possible. Well, Sorry? well, what about early life forms? For example, let's take the dinosaurs, my, one of my favorite subjects. Did they create the dinosaurs or were they here already when the aliens landed? No, I believe that they created the dinosaurs, and then they realized that it was it was wrong. It was not really like they um, they had to terminate them. So um, because they were too big, or because they couldn't, uh, I don't know exactly why, but I believe that they created them first, and then they destroyed the, their um, creation, and then started all over again. Well, I've talked about the possibility that the aliens trying to uh, jumpstart the human race, humanoid aliens, might have actually directed an asteroid at Earth to destroy the dinosaurs based on the idea that the Chicxulub crater in Mexico is filled with gypsum, which is only found on 1% of our planet. But that would have caused literally trillions of droplets of sulfuric acid to ascend into the atmosphere, acting as mirrors reflecting the sunlight away from the Earth, actually intensifying the so-called nuclear winter effect and making it even more likely the dinosaurs would die out. I was wondering if that's been discussed by the Raelians, if that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There were uh, huge explosions, uh, but it, I don't, it didn't happen by chance. They, they created those explosions. Well, do you think it's possible they actually directed an asteroid at, at Earth at the Chicxulub crater. Yeah. I mean, we see oh, this yeah. on TV now, you know, uh, such as Star Trek, but any advanced society could conceivably uh, have reached that point, any point we see in science fiction. If we can imagine it, someone...